Anyway, it's three past the hour. Why don't we go ahead and get started? People can join as they join. Um, let's just think here. Anything on the AI is worth mentioning? Um, I think Austin, he's not going to make the call today. Um, and I haven't heard back from him on the logo yet, so I'm assuming he's still working on it. He mentioned that they're going through some deadlines and stuff internally, so that's why he's been so busy. But I'm, I think we'll get to it eventually. Um, Okay, community time. Before we get to Thomas's um, K -native, event, or, sorry, K Native eventing demo, are there any other community related topics people would like to bring up? All right, not hearing any. In that case, I assume I should stop sharing. And Thomas, you can go ahead and steal the share. Sure. Uh, forgive me if I do this stupidly. It's my first time I've done screen share on Zoom in or Zoom us. Uh, am I presenting? Yes, you are. Cool. Okay, so um, for those of you who are not aware, uh, Google just revealed that we've been working with a handful of industry partners to uh, look at this whole uh, serverless thing. Uh, it has three pillars that are usable independently. Uh, they are build, serving, and eventing. Uh, so today I'm going to be talking about the eventing repo. Uh, one of the things that I will do that you did not see in stage is I will be not using the build repo. Um, so this is one of the design principles is that all three of these components uh, can come together to have uh, more value, but they are independently. Uh, so instead today I use a tool I like called Co. Um, so for those of you who are not familiar with Kubernetes, uh, you apply YAML files, you have to already have you know, Docker available somewhere. Co is Go Kubernetes, um, so you can if I check out um, my function.yaml. Uh, you'll see in here that where it's supposed to have an image, uh, it actually just lists a Go namespace. And so if I co-apply instead of a kubectl apply, uh, it will actually build, create the Docker image, and deploy. For me, that's even you know when I'm just doing a tech demo, that's an even easier uh, mode. So I don't have to use the build version or the build product in order to use the eventing product. Um, so uh, let me actually quickly figure out why I haven't cleaned up my demo yet. Um, cuddle get revision. Okay, looks like this is just old. Yep. Um, okay, so uh, first what I'm going to do is show that the system is fully extensible. So if I do kubectl uh, get event type, uh, it doesn't know any event types. It doesn't actually ship with any event types or event sources. Um, but if I wanted to, uh, I actually, we have some sample ones already available. So kubectl apply, actually co-apply since it has some build processes. Um, package sources, um, we'll do Kate's events. Um, so now this basically created these pluggable event sources and event types. The whole system now knows what a dev.knative, since we're following the cloud, cloud event standard, we're going to namespace our own things that we made up. Uh, dev.knative kates events. Um, so if I do the same command, kubectl, get event type, it now knows that there is one available. Um, what this does is it teaches future commands that if I have a flow, which is our binding between an event source and an action, um, uh, I can now reference those same type of event types. Uh, and I can have a declarative system where I want to reach into this and now Knative eventing knows the Docker jobs or the Docker images for the uh, Kubernetes jobs that would have to run to set up this infrastructure. So um, let's actually create an action. So I have um, um, and this is deploying actual uh, auto scaling function. Uh, um, so for this, we actually created a uh, Go SDK. This is an evolution of the uh, SDK we open sourced at the Copenhagen demo which actually, to the best of my knowledge, was secretly the first live demo of Knative. Um, so at Copenhagen, we were actually running Knative for the Google sample. Um, so we, uh, but we rewrote it to be a bit more go idiomatic. So um, 
right here we have something where it takes a Golang context. For anyone who's familiar with Go, you'll this will be a very familiar class. Uh, pretty much every function has a context at context. And then the second parameter is whatever the heck you want. Um, you can, your handler can have zero, one, or two functions. If it is two, it's in this order. Um, we do the automatic unmarshalling. You can also return either nothing, an error, or anything you want that would be used for an event continuation and an error. Um, so you don't actually have to worry about the nuances of cloud events handling at all. Uh, and you say event.handler, and all of a sudden you have an HTTP handler uh, that follows the cloud events HTTP transport bindings. But uh, now that we have that created, let's go ahead and actually deploy our flow to bind the two together. Um, I have, um, flow that YAML. Um, once we do that, we should suddenly get some new uh, subscription feeds as well. And that will be what actually makes the cloud events flow from uh, the Kubernetes native event stream to our cloud function that accepts them. Thomas, quick question for you. Earlier, you said you created an uh, event source. Can you elaborate a little on what that event source uh, actually is inside the Kubernetes environment? You know, what is the resource and what does it represent? Uh, so, I mean, there is a new Kubernetes type, um, kube. So we have this new thing called Kate's events. So an event type can say it is served by, or like it's delegate for handling operations on that is now Kate's events. Um, and this is the thing that's basically our, our strategy pattern for how to actually manage uh, that a flow has been created or deleted. Um, so this Kate's events configuration is what actually fires off the Kubernetes job that will run uh, having created this new uh, binding between my event stream in my local Kubernetes instance and this cloud function. Or this, uh, I guess. Uh, well, the event source is not the, that's the flow that's binding the sources. The thing that says you can, this it, thing is going to have events, right? Yeah, it's the, it's the strategy for how to enact your declared interest. Does that make sense at all? Good. Yeah, sorry, I was on mute. Yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, okay, it's meant to start. Uh, although it looks like I have, let me figure out what went wrong here real quick. Image can't be pulled. Uh, I might have to back up, figure out what happened with this demo. I'm somehow not able to download my my Docker image for the feed. Um, I should have had a pre-baked one. Oh yeah, I accidentally ran. This is the danger with Co is that you might accidentally run Co or Cube Cuddle when you met Co. Um, While you're doing that, Sarah, that was you in the background, right? Yep. That's what I thought. Okay, gotcha. Okay, we'll see if this can case deployments. Okay, um, let's try rerunning that. Cube cuddle apply. Oh, not cube cuddle. Co apply f. Um, oh, 
which is um, So we should see any subscription getting created. Um, we can also keep going get pod watch, see what's okay. Um, I might follow up on on uh, Slack with why if I figure out why the image is getting pulled. Um, but if it's failing to download the image, I'm not 100 percent sure what's going on right now. I apologize about that. This is a real live demo. Yep. <laughs> I will come with a pre-baked one with the conclusion next week. Yeah, maybe we can record a little video if the candidate team doesn't already. Sure. Did you want to do that other demo or, or do you think that covers it? Um, I can try. Uh, as long as it doesn't take too long, yeah. Go apply. And this one, um, actually, I have. You can see that I have a couple of poster topics in my project. Uh, I'm going to use the event source one uh, as my subscription. So, co. Um, so now I should see that the subscription is created. If I weren't having, I have an idea why it may be failing. Oh, yeah, I filed the bug, and uh, there's a simple, a single line of code you have to change. So you have locally this, so you can install again, but change first this line. So feed, uh, feed uh, controller is using always pull strategy. Okay. Uh, defines the feedlet pod uh, uh, container with always pull should be if not present. So yeah. Uh, is that something? I shared the link. Uh, I don't know if you see it now. Where? Uh, here in Zoom. Oh. I don't actually get to see that, I think, when I am presenting. Then in uh, eventing uh, repo issue 284. Um, if this is going to have us be rebuilding a couple of files, I don't want to hold the whole group uh, hostage. I will do either recording or show off a pre baked demo at the end. Okay, that sounds great. Thank you very much. Are there any questions for Thomas before we move on? I have a question. So, so Thomas, is the um, goal of this um, Kinetis event, is it to produce an event or to bind the event to a function? Or to create an event, I would say. Or, or I even, it, so I, I assume the, I mean, the goal is to bind the event to the function, right? Um, create the event just for simulation, you have an event source. But in real situation, right, the event source could be any, anything, right? Could be an, an IoT device or could be a, a middleware or, or any or, or storage or streaming source. Yeah, so there's you know, multiple personas involved in this. Um, so if someone uh, wanted to make their event source available, uh, they could create the, uh, the YAML files uh, that describe their event source and the Docker images that would actually uh, uh, execute that intent that would be able to create a new registration or clean it up. 
Um, and then any actual cluster operator could now add that capability to their entire cluster. And the, um, the oh, I think I just also remembered one of the oh, uh, I think I forgot to install the bus actually as one of the things that the cluster operator is supposed to do. I should follow the demo scripts. Uh, anyways, the <laughs> Uh, but then, you know, any developer inside that Knative or their Kubernetes cluster would be able to receive that event feed. Um, so it's, in some sense, a, a matchmaking service. Um, we're not trying to create all the event sources. We're trying to make sure that there's a platform where uh, someone can create an event source easily, that uh, developers for those clusters can handle those event sources. Um, and then also we've been working with another number of companies to uh, possibly base their cloud products off of this, which means hypothetically, if you target the Knative uh, framework, then your event source might be accessible, say in both Riff and OpenWhisk and Google's offerings. Okay, so you're trying to bridge, to, to bridge the event source to uh, uh, the event consumer, like, you know, um, or event service platform, something like that, right? Yep. Yeah, and the so flow, you are going to. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, I'm trying to say. So you will. So I assume you're going to provide provide functionality for, um, how to say it, for the for transport for in for um you know, the transport the event from the event source to the uh, event consumer. Is that right? Mm -hmm. This is actually the thing that I think I forgot to set up correctly, which is why I think the demos were failing, um, is that just like event sources are pluggable, transports are pluggable as well. Um, so flow is the top level, like uh, friendliest abstraction. Underneath it, there's different buses that you can install and buses can have instances of channels uh, that will deliver the actual events. Uh, and so we are trying to stay completely agnostic to what the transport that is actually used. Uh, we have plugins right now for the stub bus, which is just an in-memory transport, Cloud PubSub, and Kafka. Okay, I see. Yeah. Um, so so goal that flow, mm -hmm. YAML file is the key functionality um, and the connective kind of you'll provide, right? Okay, so event source itself is outside of the um, this native project, right? Correct. You could interface with any event source. Okay. Yes, it's an explicit goal that Knative will support event sources without recompiling Knative. Similarly, it will support different transports without recompiling Knative, um, and that the cluster operator can make uh, decisions about how that cluster would operate in default though you could even theoretically using the lower, lower level components set up exactly one event stream to use, you know, Cloud PubSub, for example, and the rest of them might use Kafka. And there can be in cluster event sources as well. Mm -hmm. Okay, I see. Yeah. Okay, so I have another question. It looks like there's quite some, you know, I feel there are a lot of CLIs need to, I mean, the user need to, um, to do to, uh, enable this. Are you thinking about about like automating all this or make this make the the whole process simpler, easier? I would say e easier. Well, we have an alpha you can sign up right now for the serverless plugin for GKE. So it's a one-click install on the hosted solution to have this all. Um, otherwise, you like Helm is typically the installer tool for Kubernetes. Sorry, I, but I think part of the question, though, that some of you may be wondering is, is Knative meant to be used by end users, or is it meant to be infrastructure on which function platforms built? Uh, honestly, I think both. Um, so f I personally, uh, you know, I like those abstractions. I could see myself sticking at that level, uh, especially because Knative has, even in its, on its own, kind of an above and below the fold set of abstractions. So on serving, for example, there's just the service type, and that's this nice friendly wrapper. You only have to deploy one. 
uh, but underneath it, it actually has things like the route, which is the load balancing URI. It has the configuration, which is your current state of what's been deployed and it has the revisions. Um, so if, for example, you went to your shop became more advanced and you decided that uh, devs can push uh, any, any revision out, but only the operators can control which one is serving traffic live, you didn't have to add uh, or replace infrastructure to do that. Right. So just, right. to, just to rehash one last thing before we end on this is, I guess one of the main goals that you guys are looking for is to make sure that cloud events are compatible across multiple clouds, those that do adopt K-Native. Is my mm -hmm. understanding correct? Yeah, so um, like I've been pushing very hard to make sure that uh, cloud events is a lingua franca of this system. Um, so like that's why I apologize. I've been out of a lot of these meetings. I've been rewriting uh, demos to use a you know cloud events end to end. Got it. Thanks. Mm -hmm. All right. I think we need to kind of wrap it up now. But any very very short questions for Thomas? Otherwise, we're going to move on. All right, cool. Uh, I have a, oh, go, go ahead, Kathy. Sorry, I have a short question. Okay, yeah. I hope it's wrong. Um, so basically, uh, you, if the event source format is not cloud event format, um, I mean, you are going to um, um, translate it, right? Is that part of your functionality? I mean, uh, event source the, in the YAML sense, yes. It is responsible for making sure that the thing that comes out is a cloud event though like the con conceptual like a database if that was an event source could very easily just uh you know support cloud events natively oh yeah yeah if native uh, yeah right but if not you are going to do the mapping right correct um that's generally what the expectation would be of someone who wanted to create an event source is that they maybe for example subscribe to some legacy webhook but then they uh, add eventful semantics and you know, uh, wrap it in the standard envelope. Okay, thanks. Thank you. All right, cool. Okay. All right, so thank you very much, Thomas. Um, okay, moving forward. Uh, I know Austin isn't on the call and there was no SDK call uh, this week at all, so I don't think there's anything to update here. Uh, but Kathy, is there anything you'd like to update the group on relative to your uh, workflow work group? Okay, so we um, in last in, uh, in actually this Tuesday's meeting, we, we went through the um, all the comments, and uh, we resolved you know um, almost all of them, and then we specifically uh, discussed uh, uh, a, a parallel state, which um, which which is you know um, proposed based on uh, a comment, and we discussed you know um, that parallel state and also um, I think Nahiro presented the use case that um, that shows the need for that um, parallel state and then we also um, discuss the, the filter um, the filter mechanism at different uh, point of the workflow like you know from um, from the event information passing to the function and so we can have a filter there and then when also have a filter between the information uh, between uh, information passing um, uh, between passing of information between the, um, the functions also between the states so we discussed that and then we have several action items um, which are you know which are listed in the um, uh, the meeting minutes um, in this I think this meeting minutes minutes have that workflow um, meeting uh, meeting minutes so if people are interested, you can go and take a look. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Any questions for Kathy? All right. Cool. Thank you, Kathy. Uh, moving forward, I don't think there's anything on issue maintenance we need to deal with, so we can jump right into PRs. Now, last week we were talking about Clemens' PR about qualifying profiles, basically setting the bar for when we're going to accept new uh, specifications around serializations and, and transport bindings. And then Ryan had a suggestion for some changes. Ryan, you want to talk to your suggested changes here? Sure. So I basically just 
uh, put the first paragraph of Clement's description into bullets and uh, kind of just do away with this second paragraph. Kind of to me is a lot of description, not very clean. So I kind of just leave it with the first paragraph into, in, in shortcut, it's really straightforward. It's either a public, like, uh, uh, what's that called? It's, uh, either it's already a, a standard or it's a de facto standard. It's pretty much like that. So just be clear, what you're talking, uh, let me hide the uh, comments here for a sec so it's easier for people to see. <clears throat> I think what you're proposing is to replace both of these paragraphs, correct? Yes. So both of those go away in favor of just this paragraph and the bulleted list. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's either, it's either a formal st standard or a de facto standard, to put it shortly. Right. All right, any questions for Ryan on that? I don't think it changes the, the meaning behind Cummins' PR, it just puts it into a different syntax more forcefully, right? Yeah. yeah. Kathy, were you gonna say something? I have a question here. So I say uh, a particle standardization body, a listed sum, are these four the only um, standard or with, or these are just some examples? And another question is uh, how we define the de facto standard. Um, yeah, the de facto standard is, to be honest, it's also not that clean cut. But as we discussed, things like uh, uh, Kafka or like Kubernetes, uh, Kubernetes in terms of uh, container orchestration. Those are type of things that become pretty much for, in, in a long term, I think it's called, any reasonable people would think that's a standard. It's not as clean cut as I want, but it uh, seems like we cannot get away with that. And, and for the first question, I'm not an expert in all, all these forms, like, like all these standard forms. Uh, I just copied whatever Clemens listed there. He seems to know all these standard bodies. <laughs> and if, if he thinks that's the exhaustive list, then that's it. If it's not, I would like to see an exhaustive list because that at least makes it, again, I, my, my purpose is really just want to make it clean cut so that there are less argument or things down the line, down the road, you know, then people would say, oh, this is a standard body too. Yeah, that, that, that's the type of conversation I'm trying to avoid given this. Yeah, I'm not sure how realistic it is to list all of them in there. That's why I was wondering whether you should just put an EG in front of it. Um, oh, I see. Yeah. Then EG. Uh, I see. Yeah. 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 Just, just like the Kafka. That was one, good. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Cause yeah, I mean, for example, ISO isn't in the list and that's a, that's a recognized one as well. Right. So and the list may change over time. So. Yeah. 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 That, that, that I think makes sense. Okay. Uh, what do other people think about this proposed change in text? Yeah, I'd agree with that. There's a lot of uh, standards out there. Okay. But is ah. it all, aside, from the, if I, aside from the missing EG, what do people think? So I um, just added a comment to propose. I think I liked somebody said that, that maybe we should attempt to make a little more of a definition of de facto. And so I, I um, added a comment while we were talking, which is, something that has an open source implementation as in end is in use by services or products from independent ven vendors. Meaning that like it's out there, different people are using it. It's just, it's a suggestion of, of making it like, like how, like it's, it might be like, it's a little vague to be like, what does it mean to be accepted in its ecosystem? Uh, I have Oh, I see. Um. I, I agree with this as at least a min bar. Um, you know, for example, I, I could argue that Google Cloud PubSub is a pretty de facto standard in the industry. However, I don't think it meets the bar that we can do or imply in this, this world. <laughs> yeah, now, now it gets to the... Hello? Yep, go ahead. Go ahead. No, yeah, yeah. I, I was worried about, actually, I, I spent some time looking at the third paragraph. Is 
whether to try to, I tried to rephrase the third paragraph to make it more inclusive, but still clean cut. But at the end, I cannot do that. So I, I, I get it away with, because it seems like the, the Thomas uh, thing is, belongs to third paragraph. And uh, I'm not too sure. I, I also struggled with that. I thought about these things, and uh, but I cannot find a very clean cut. I and I deep down I think the reason Clemens included that third paragraph is for those type of services. And uh, but then when you say third paragraph, you mean this one, right? I'm sorry. When you say third paragraph, do you mean this one? Oh, the, Thirty-seven. The, the the second paragraph. Sorry. Yeah, the second okay. paragraph. Yeah, it's it's kind of become a slippery slope when you just say. I, initially, I thought we could say any service that is used by at least three more independent parties, something like that. But then it's still kind of hard to define used by three. What does used mean? Or do you need to find three different projects or? I'm not 100% sure. Okay, uh, before we go to the next person, we'll just talk. If, you're, if you're typing, can you go on mute, please? I hear some typing in the background. And Dan, are you trying to say something? Yeah, um, I think the, the, that third paragraph is actually kind of important because it's trying to make sure, I mean, I know we all love Kafka and stuff, but the thing to remember about Kafka is there's part of it that's an open protocol and part of it that's actually like an implementation. And uh, that works because that protocol allows alternate implementations. So I think that's what Clemens is just the third paragraph is. And I do want to make sure we don't lose that um, just because, uh, you know, the idea is to make sure that we're only letting things into this that, that aren't going to lead to vendor lock in at some point. Just to be clear, we're talking about this paragraph here. Is someone else going to say something in there? Uh, this is this is Colin. Yes. You know, I I miss some of the early history of this. Um, why why are protocols even you know uh, blaster defined in the first place? And, you know, and thinking in terms of separation of concerns, why not just a specification of what a binding whole protocol is required to do, and then organically just let whatever people want to use. Uh, use and the most popular will be the most popular or you know the favorite will be the favorite so the I think the big question is whether we gave them space in our our formal github for advertising so we everyone should like you know to, to bring up cloud positive again uh, we are going to have a formal you know spec of how Google says cloud positive should have cloud events go on them but Google's going to have to use its own website to, to advertise that documentation. And then we can have uh, a link from it here, but not a, like an, a full markdown page. But yeah, what, what, what I, I don't want, like, like nobody owns HTTP, right? Um, and I think there, there are other ones where if it's a de facto standard, the person, like the community may want to create a protocol expression for cloud events without whatever entity originally made that thing being involved, right? And then there are other things where like the company wants to promote their company. And so we want to be like, okay, that's your business, not the community's business, right? So I'm trying to figure out the best way to make progress here. And um, I think <clears throat> a couple of different things here. One is stick an EG in front of the list here. Two is to see if we can firm up the definition of de facto standard. And I think Ryan, or I guess everybody else on the call, needs to think about whether Sarah's proposed text here is, is sufficient to define that. Uh, but Dan, your comment about the Kafka stuff, it wasn't clear to me what you were looking for on that. Was there a particular sentence in this paragraph that you want to make sure we keep? Uh, well, I mean, I think that last comment was, was spot on, is that we don't want this to be an advertising springboard for any one vendor, right? True. And that's why the alternate implementations piece is kind of important. I, the Kafka thing was a, kind of a sidebar, a distraction. I'm not saying change that part of the, the text. Okay. So if we were to adopt language similar to what Sarah had proposed, would that address your concern? 
Uh, I think it would, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I have a quick question on that. My understanding was that uh, the bindings are on a transport, where something like a Kafka to me is more of a product than a transport. Like you're not going to see somebody going, I'm going to use, you know, a pub sub using the Kafka transport without all the other Kafka, uh, you know, uh, uh, components. So shouldn't you make that a de facto standard of a transport as opposed to a product? I think that's you know, you bet. by eco ecosystem category because yeah, he didn't actually give it a formal title, right? Well, and I think you've actually hit my concern on the head is that like there's a, Kafka means a lot now. It, it doesn't just mean a transport anymore. It doesn't just mean topic. So I think it's important to be careful when we carve out things like that that we're talking about. The, you know, the, the part that's relevant for, for cloud events and not the rest of it necessarily the whole platform. So is there some alternative text you guys would like to see? I think it's probably touching on the text that Sarah wrote. Yeah, I think I agreed with somebody like um, Thomas and somebody else pointed out that this is a like, this is a min bar. This is probably not sufficient. Yeah, yeah. I, so I, I was thinking just like this, it was say used by not just by other services, but put a quantitatively, say, more than five services. A like Kafka, again, whether it's a, uh, the original Kafka, the, the PubSub uh, product definitely is used very widely. 10 is not even a, it's a clear bar. We can say more than 10 uh, different companies are used, communities are using it. It seems to me uh, um, we should put a quantitative number there not just by others other than otherwise people can say I have another buddy you know using me then they can clear that bar I agree we could have that bar but um, my original thought was just put something more quantitative than someone is using it would people be okay with that just put an actual number in there but again is it talking about a transport which we're binding to or a product because nobody's going to implement a for example, a Kafka transport, but there are transports that uh, are emerging, for example, in the IoT world that are becoming yeah. things like Zigbee Plus and CoAP and all these other, which really are transports that are not necessarily standardized, but are uh, a lot of products out there using them as transports as opposed to a full suite of products that have to work together. Because without yeah. a, for example, a Kafka client, which everything is implemented in the client, it's really not a transfer. Um, that seems to me a, it's, it's a kind of different angle. Uh, but for example, for the examples you, you, uh, you raised are good examples. Those are, to me, is de facto standards. Um, yep, exactly. And transport standards as well, which is what I assume you want to bind to. Right? Um, transport. It's, that's the part I'm not 100% sure. I, I want to hear others' thought. I don't know if this is only transport only or it actually applies to some other things. For the Kafka version, the reason I, uh, I think that Clemens mentioned that was also I thought it, because it's pops up. So when the, 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 the events coming in and out, that's the, the format we want to use. Like we can work with Kafka's pub and sub events. So I don't think it, this is the best use of our time to wordsmith exactly here, but Ryan, I do get the sense that you may have a general idea of, of where people would like to see this go off. Yeah, I, I can, I can give another shot. shot. Okay, yeah, and then people can come back. I mean, and just people, people keep in mind uh, that the odds of us getting the exact right text, 100% accurate <clears throat> or perfect yeah, is yeah. probably pretty slim. So <laughs> we need to set, you know, say what is good enough to, to get the point across just so that people when we, when we come back to say no to their proposed spec they want to add, we can be clear to say, look, you didn't meet the bar we defined here. Yeah, yeah. That's, all that's all we're trying to do. Yeah. All right, cool. Any last minute questions or comments for Ryan? And I think Clemens might be back next week. I, I don't know for sure if he's or not, but maybe he'll be back to comment on this as well. All right, cool, thank you, Ryan. Um, moving forward. All right. Um, so we can skip these two. Uh, let's see if we can quickly look at David's schema validation one. 
Oops, sorry, he opened up an alternative one. Uh, I don't think David is on the call. So what he was basically trying to do is to add schema, J, uh, JSON schema, sorry, to our schema stuff, to our JSON stuff, I should say. Um, so we had this little bit there, and then he added the JSON schema itself for a cloud event as a separate document. Um, I believe this change may have actually gone in like yesterday or something, so it may have been maybe too soon to formally approve, but I wanted to get people's general sense of whether they're okay with this direction or whether they don't like the idea at all. Any concerns we go in this direction? Okay, let me ask the bold question. Do people want more time to review this or does it seem <clears throat> obvious enough we can accept it? I'm assuming we people need more time to review. Yeah, need, need more time to review it. Okay, just want to double check. Sure. All right. We expect to have people adding Avro schemas and, and the like also. Adding which kind of schemas? Avro. That I don't know. What do other people think? Sorry, the, the bigger question is, uh, is there a set of, of arbitrary schema specification types that uh, we could be opening a door for? Well, if we have a if we have a spec that defines how to serialize into a particular format, I think it makes sense to have a schema for that format, right? Sorry, I was muted. Uh, yeah, it, you're right. I'm sorry. Yeah. All right. Any other questions? Okay. So, <clears throat> please review this when you get a chance. We'll see if we can vote on it next week, assuming there are no major comments. Okay, next. Hold on a sec. Sorry, I had to clear the frog in my throat. All right, so let's talk about extensions. Um, so I had opened up a PR earlier, and then I closed it in favor of this one. It's, it's almost the exact same thing. I just thought it'd be cleaner to, to do a new, P, new PR. So this PR does a couple of things. Um, first, it takes the step towards making our specification, our, our core spec, into more of an info set, as Clemens likes to call it, where we pretty much define in the abstract form what are the properties that we're going to define. And it leaves the entire notion of serialization concerns for the other specifications, right? So the JSON spec, the HTTP spec, will all deal with serialization of the info set that's defined in spec.md. That's the one thing that we do. Um, it adds some text to the primer to make it clear, or to try to make it clear, when people should consider adding things to uh, the cloud event as an extension versus stick it inside the data, meaning the, the real event itself. Try to provide some guidance there. That way people don't think that, oh, everything must go into the cloud event extension when really it's not used for that interoperability layer that we're trying to solve. It's really part of the event data itself. Try to make some, put some clarity around that. Um, next, I heard some confusion about the word um, extensions as a file name uh, because some people seem to think that when we talk about extensions for our specification, uh, the, those extensions only came from the extensions.md file as opposed to they can come from pretty much anywhere. And so to try to address that, I thought, okay, maybe we renamed it experimental or something like that. Uh, Thomas expressed some concerns about that. Personally, I don't care about the name, um, but if there is some confusion around that, we may want to consider an alternative name to extensions. So I'd like to get some feedback about whether that's a concern for people or not. Uh, Thomas, let me just finish going through the list and then I'll, then I'll go back to you in just a sec. Um, as I said, it left the serialization for the transport and binding specs. Um, and then based upon the discussions that was going on in that Google Doc I put forward about uh, which use cases around extensions you want to support, while it wasn't unanimous, I did get the sense that a fair number of people were saying, okay, let's, it's okay to put for the JSON serialization uh, extensions at the top level. And that may be a contentious decision, but I, I flipped the coin and landed on that so we can discuss that. And that's, so that's another part of the PR. So those are the main points of the PR itself. Now, Thomas, I think you might have had a question. Oh, just a, a very quick uh, suggestion is that um, maybe if it's the actual file name that's a, an issue, uh, we could just call it uh, documented extensions .md or something like that. Um, just to, to hint that like, yes, there are undocumented or... Yeah, and we could add to the text at the top of it. Yeah, I, I like that. Other than it's really long, I like it. <laughs> yep. 
Okay. Oh, no. I hear bites are cheap nowadays. Yeah. <laughs> um, all right. Before I start going through a little more detail, are there any questions about the high level goals of the PR? Okay. Now, I'm not going to say walk through line by line, um, but I do want to point out some of the key things that may. Um, So in the primer, again, I talk about a little bit about when things might appear as extensions versus in the data. And that the data is meant, is meant, data is meant strictly for use by the component process in the event, while extensions are mainly used for the transport type of deal, um, operations. I guess that's really what we're concerned about. Um, I, do, I do go a little bit into about extensions themselves in the extension section to make it clear that pretty much you can put anything you want into the extensions uh, stuff that we that we allow for. Um, uh, there's something I want to miss. I can't remember what it was though. Um, yeah, anyway, if it comes back to me, I'll, I'll mention that. Um, in the spec itself, I deleted the extensions property here and just basically add text that says producers may add additional uh, extensions um, and that uh, the, the other specs will define how they get serialized. That way we don't get into this whole question of, you know, are extensions under our bag or not, because the base of that bag and info set level isn't part of our discussion here. Now that's not to say that a serialization could not add a bag for them. That's completely up to the serialization. It's just at the info spec level, we don't talk about it. Okay. And I think that's the bulk of it. Um, are there any questions on that? Comments? Um, yeah, go ahead, Sarah. So this is saying that like anybody can add an arbitrary extension at the top level. That's the gist of the thing. There's two different aspects to it. One, anybody can add an extension, yes. Two, for the JSON serialization, yes, it will appear at the top level. I think I have an example. Uh, right, but then there's no way to differentiate what is the core spec and what is an extension except through the documentation of the spec. True. And I actually put together a document explaining why that's all goodness. Um, I'm not sure we have time to walk through the whole thing, but in the agenda doc, you know, under this whatever extensions, I put a link to a document here. And I actually put through, I put three little pages together to explain why that's actually a good thing. Um, if you will want, I can quickly walk through some of the highlights of that. And we, have, we only have five minutes left, so I don't think we're going to get to another deep topic anyway. So let me just quickly touch on it. So first, I want to make sure that, that we level set a little about what are extensions. So first, I want to make sure people understand that or agree that for an extension to be used properly, typically the person who defines the extension are going to have, is going to have to do certain things, right? They're going to, first of all, have to do things like define its name. You know, how is it going to appear? You know, is it foo versus foo dash property? You know, what is it, what is it called and how is it going to appear when it's serialized? That kind of stuff. They obviously need to define the semantics of it, right? What does this thing actually mean? What does its value represent, right? If it's just random gorp, it's not going to be very useful to people. And then, of course, they're going to have to find its type, right? Is it integer, string? Is it a complex structure? What are its valid values? If there is a fixed list, those kind of things, right? So they basically need to fully define what this property is, basically the same way we've done for our core spec, right? Otherwise, if they don't do that, there's a very big possibility that it's not going to be widely used um, at all or properly used. People will misinterpret it. They really should be clear about this stuff. In my mind, they almost need to write a spec, okay? Um, now extensions from the cloud event perspective are basically anything that's not defined in spec.md, right? So that's our extensions.md file, third party, vendors, middleware, whoever, basically other stuff that producers may decide to include in, inside our cloud events. Those are what our extensions are. So anything outside of spec.md. The reason I'm mentioning this is because there have, I've, I've gotten the sense that there was some confusion that only certain other properties are quote extensions. And there may be different classifications of extensions. And I want to make it clear that from our spec perspective, extensions are extensions are extensions. There is no specialization of extensions. They're all, if it's not inspect that on the, it's an extension. Um, <clears throat> and that's what this last paragraph down here is basically trying to say is, you know, from our point of view, as of right now, all we have are spec defined properties and extensions. That's it. 
Okay. Now, if I can ask a follow up question, oh, is there any such thing as invalid data then? Invalid data. Uh, you, uh, aside from the case where you actually put like bad values inside of a spec defined property or something like that, I, I'm inclined to say no. Okay. So I think that's one of the things where there's probably different camps. So can you elaborate a little on why you think they're, what it, well, can, can you give an example of what an invalid data might be? Uh, so if the spec, def like, uh, there's obviously things where you take an existing well-defined uh, field and you put something that doesn't comply with the spec, but there's also different theories on whether or not someone conforms to our spec if they have any superset of data at all that we, that we describe, or if they use the sandbox we've given. So if our spec has a map property or a, a structured object property, are they allowed to add new fields that are part of that structured property? I would strongly, strongly, strongly say no, because I would like to say that when we have to find our spec and the object has this format, we should be able to add new fields to that object and not worry about conflicting with things elsewhere in the world. So, if I, so I understand what you're saying correctly is if we define a property in the spec that is a map, that means there's a natural extensibility point in there that people may think is, exists. And you're saying we should not allow people to add additional properties to that map because we own that map, if I understand you correctly. And I think if so, that's up for us to decide. So when we define that property, I think it's our job to be clear about whether people can add additional properties to that map or not. Does that answer your question? So I have a, a dog. Yeah. I have a, a, a question, okay, for all this, right? So the, your, um, I think your PR is trying to define the serialization, right? I think we need to separate um, these things, you know. So there are some um, attributes that belong to the main spec, which is in the spec.md, right? And then there are some attributes which are extensions, which means uh, they do not have official standing. They do not belong to the uh, main spec. So that's one thing we need to, uh, to discuss or, or decide, right, to be clear to everyone. And then another thing is how we serialize um, those attributes. And um, I think the serialization should be the same no matter whether that attribute is in the main spec or is in the um, or is the extension, and whether it's in extension spec or not. Um, that serialization should be the same. It doesn't matter whether the um, the that attribute is in the main spec or in the extension. So I would I would like the serialization PR to just address the serialization. And then maybe there's another extension PR to address what, like the criteria to decide what kind of attributes could, should be in the main spec. What are the, just like, you know, uh, I think we have a, uh, a PR to define the criteria for the, uh, for the uh, particle, uh, which the serialization particle, right? Which will be part of this work group uh, standard. I think we should have two that people will not be confused. Otherwise, if we confuse the serialization with uh, you know with the information, the extension or in the main, that that's a that's a, that's why you know we discuss so many times times in so many in multiple meetings. We still have not uh, sorted out because I think people are coming from different perspective, understand it differently. So, that, so that's my I, one comment. Yeah, no, um, I understand. And let me just, let me just address that first. So. Um, I know I put the PR in there probably too late in the cycle or too late in the week for people to really review it, but I actually think that's pretty much what I did in the sense that I left the serialization out of the main spec and pushed it off to the other specs, meaning the JSON spec, the HTTP spec, and I don't treat extensions any differently than spec-defined properties. So I think that actually is exactly what you were asking for, so I did that. The one thing this PR did not do, and I agree with you, we should deal with that in a separate PR, is are, are the rules clear as to when we will include a property in the main spec or when we're going to push it out and say, no, it's an extension? I think that should be a, a separate PR if, this, if the text in the primer does not address that today. Okay. So yeah, okay, so I have another comment is mm -hmm. the format of the attribute. I, I think, you know, we should not let the format of the attributes 
uh, of the uh, metadata attribute to, to decide whether it's in the main spec or it, it should be out of the main spec. Um, uh, that's my, 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 that's my, my, my thought. For so, example, uh, I really think, you know, um, so give an example of, the, um, of this um, correlation, the, this identification label for correlation. I think if it's, if it's needed by a lot of use cases, it's going to be commonly used. It doesn't matter what's the format we're going to decide as a group. I think it should be in the main spec. But if it is not widely used, it's only used by you know very specific, a specific use case, right? Or it's only used by a vendor, then it should be out of the, um, the main spec. I'm just taking that as, as an example. There could be other examples, I mean, down the road. Yeah, I'm not, I'm so not sure like, there's a disagreement on that point, but take a look at my PR and see if you think I say anything different. Like, I don't think that's inconsistent with what the PR says. I think that opens up another question. So for some attributes, like for example, it could be a map format, but the, but the content of the, the key value pair itself might not, we cannot predefine it. It's just like this identification label, right? For different use cases, you have different um, identification labels associated with that event, because the, uh, I would say not for different use cases, for different event sources, because the, the, those event sources are all different, right? The identification label, additional identification label associated with that event could be different. For example, for some event, it could be a house address. For another event, it could be a travel request ID. And for another event, it could be like, uh, how to say, uh, a stock trade, uh, uh, stock trade, uh, 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 how to say, stock trade ID, something like that, right? Or it could be an employee ID or department ID. There are so many diff. They are all different. So, Kathy, what you have to say is all these ultimately fall under identification label. There are different attributes there, but they still fall under identification. Is that right? Yeah. Okay. That's right. Yeah. Okay, so I think as long as we find the identification label that attribute clearly, I think we are good, right? Because there are some attributes that by itself, the nature. So, Kathy, I'm gonna, I, yeah, I'm going to have to stop just because we're out of time. Please take oh, a look. Okay. Everybody, yeah, everybody, please take a look at the PR. I think I actually did try to address your, your concerns in there, Kathy, but everybody else, please take a look at the PR. And in particular, also take a look at this short little PowerPoint thing I put together explaining why I think top little things are the right way to go. But very quickly, I could just get the final roll call for people. I think, Louie, I heard you. Dan, I heard you. Chris Borchers, you still there? Uh, I'm here. All right. Stanley. I'm here. Colin? I think I heard Colin already, right? Yep, I'm here. Yep. Uh, Shivam, I'm yeah. switching your name, I apologize. Okay, Simon, you there? Yes, sir. And Baram, you there? Yep. Baram, you still there? Yep. Can you hear me? Okay. Yep, got it. And I know Dan was on, got, he pinged me offline, so I know he was there. All right, did I miss anybody on the roll call? All right, cool. Thank you guys very much. And please do take a look at those documents and please don't wait for next week's phone call to comment positive or negatively please comment on the pr your uh, any pr that's open in particular but on the extension one so we should, let's see if we can try to get this one behind us and i apologize just, for running over okay we should talk about the extension because it's like not moving forward i know i'm trying to figure out some way to move it forward <laughs> so if you have ideas please suggest it but the first step is probably please comment inside the prs because silence doesn't help all right cool thank you guys we'll talk next week thanks brett Bye. Thank you. Bye.